Hey guys, what's up? So in this video, we'll be creating a small or a tiny Linux kernel using the tiny config that is available with Linux. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, first and foremost, we need to clone the Linux source code, which I did it already here. You could see this is the URL from which I fetched. You could fetch any version and it should work fine. The git clone takes pretty much of time. So I have done it already here. Now, if you do make help, and then grep minus i tiny you could see a tiny config option that is available this is to make the tiniest possible kernel so let's do make minus j two you can give the number of cores that are available in your system and then give tiny config so this is going to create a dot config file and it will have bare minimum things that are required for building the tiniest linux kernel so before building the kernel, we just need to modify a few things in the config and then let's build the kernel. So for that, do make menu config and let's make this kernel 64 bit. Now go to the device drivers. We will be enabling TTY for the character device and then go to general setup. We need to enable support for initramfs we don't need support for these compression types but it's fine let it be there and then we also need to come down this one a configure standard kernel features inside which we need to enable support for printk and then for the executable file formats we need to enable support for elf at least because we will be creating our programs using ELF and it needs to run. So we'll just give the support for it. With that thing, I think we are good. Uh, we could just try building our kernel. If I save it, okay, exit and exit. Now in order to build, just give make minus J, number of cores that are available here. In my case, it's just two because I'm using a virtual box. It's gonna take a while. Okay, now that our kernel image is ready, you could see this is the location where the kernel is. We could do ls minus lh and then give this. You could see it's around 700 KB in size, less than a megabyte, and it's a very small kernel to be honest. Now, in order to test it, I'll just copy that kernel which we created here, and then I'm gonna use the Quick Emulator to run the kernel. So, in order to run the kernel directly, you could use minus kernel option, and now you could see it's booting up and as expected, the kernel is booting up and it panicked because it is unable to find the init process. So that is the process that we are going to create the next. Now let's create a small init process which would just print out hello or the hi to the screen. And see the user space. So I'm going to touch two files here. Basic.c which will be having the C program which will print out the message to the screen. Now let's start with coding this basic.c. It's gonna be very simple. I won't be even using any standard header files. I'll show you why. I create a main function, then I'm gonna do write, which basically takes three arguments. So you could just do man to write. You could see it is taking three arguments. One is the file descriptor, second is the buffer and the buffer size. And this one internally calls the syswrite system call. So what we are gonna do here is we will define our own basic assembly program, which will give these functions and that will internally call the write system call. So here I'm just gonna do write standard output. The value is one. I'm gonna write hi and a new line. So it's actually four characters and including the null character, this is five. I'm gonna loop forever because I don't want this init process to exit. That's it. Now if you do gcc minus c basic dot c, and o basic dot o you will see this warning but ignore that if you do ls minus ls you will see this object file getting created now let's write some assembly code which will give us the right method currently the right method is not available so for that we we'll first go to the linux okay cd arc x86 include generated asm if you go over here you could see these are the system call values. For example, in order to do a sysread, you have to make a system call with the value 0 in RAX register, with the value 1 for write, 
and two four open and three four close and etc you could get all the system calls i just wanted to show you that and i will show you in a moment where you're going to use it here i'm going to make a file sys.asm i'm going to use pgnu assembler so i'm going to use intel syntax here dot intel syntax no prefix this is because by default whenever you are using a register like rax or ax in your code it will be prefixed with percentage ax percentage rax etc i don't want to use that prefix dot global this is to expose a function to the linker now we'll just write this function this function is going to be pretty simple that is move rax comma the system call number and then in 64 bit you can technically use syscall instruction if it was 32 bit you would have used in atx or hexadecimal at and then you can basically return we want the number for system call corresponding to write and which you could find it here is call 64.h write we have to use the number one now over here one do as that is the assembler and this minus o and give this file so now you have sys.o file and basic.o file now we can combine it together to create an executable you could use ld command and minus o i'll call it init basic.o sys.o and i'm going to specify the entry point using minus minus entry that is main and minus set no exit stack this should create an init program and if you do ls minus l and in it it's a very small binary now you could see that it is printing high to the screen and hangs there because we have an infinite loop there you could do control c and now we want to copy this file into the init fmfs ttio that is the archive that is used for the init fmfs so in order to create that echo in it the file name whichever you want to be part of the archive and ctio minus x format is new c which is supported by the kernel minus o for output and then you could redirect it to init.cpio and you could do ls minus l you could give cpio minus id and then input the cpio file to extract it that is the that is cpio minus id and then you can give the cpio file now that we have this you could go back to linux make help and then grep for something called iso so once you grab it you could see there is an iso image option that is available with the make it could be minus a5 and this takes basically two arguments one is the kernel argument and second one is the init ram disk file make iso image and then you could specify fd args which will be init rd equals slash init dot cpio and then I could specify fd init rd, which will be inside our user space init.cpio. Okay, with this, we could give a build. Now you could see that it created the ISO file, which is bootable and it is actually using our same kernel with the tiny config which we created. Now we could copy that ISO file and I'm copying it here. Now also you could see the size of the entire image. It's barely 1.3 MP, less than a size that you could store on a floppy drive. Now we could use the same quick emulator command, but here I wanted to specify the ISO image. So it will be image.iso. And then instead of kernel, it will be CD-ROM. Because that is the option to attach a CD-ROM and boot from a CD-ROM. And you could see it has given us a message hi and it hangs there. It was a very simple example on how to do it. We can create a basic shell or actually attach any other program there. So now that our kernel is up and running and it is able to start our init D, there were some ambiguities. I wanted to clear that part. So for example, you would be wondering why I went with this approach where I wrote a system assembly file which would be exposing this write function. And then I had this basic.c, which is technically calling this write function. So here, what I wanted to mimic is the write function that is written inside the 
glibc library. So now just give man section two and write. You could see this is the function that C would be calling or C is trying to call. And here we haven't defined any function. So compiler complained, but it still gave us the output. I'm just copying this. And now I'm copying this file basic.c to a.c and I'm opening a.c. I wanted to show you something. So what really happens if we did not do that? Okay. So for that we have to include uni std.h. This one pretty much is the write function that we are gonna call. Now let's do one thing. Let's convert this into a executable. Here I'm gonna do gcc a.c and minus o a.bin. So I have a binary here. If I do a.bin, it's gonna give the same behavior or the same output. But I just wanted to show how it internally works. Now if you do ldd and a.bin, it is a dynamic executable and it is actually linking to multiple libraries, which we don't want. We'll make it static just by using the static flag. Now if I do this, it will say it's not a dynamic executable. It, it is a statically linked executable and all the necessary libraries are also part of it. That means the glibc itself is part of it. And the definition for the write function, everything is present within that. Now that if you run it, it's gonna give the same behavior. But if you do the size, it's gonna be huge because it is having the entire library in it as well. Now let's run it using GDB. And now I have to set something like set this assembly flavor Intel. And now let's disassemble main. And this is the actual assembly code for the main function or the main entry point. From this, you can understand that it is setting up the stack. It is pushing all the things and it's actually putting the stack pointer to the base pointer. And then it is setting up three things which are of our interest. If you remember, we call the write function with three arguments. One is one for the standard output, then a character pointer to the buffer, and then the size of the buffer, let's say five. It was five in our case. Now you could see edx is passed a value of hexadecimal five, which is decimal five itself. And rsi is actually passed with a pointer, a memory address. And then edi is passed with hexadecimal one, which is decimal one. And it resembles the arguments. Now, when we compile a program, it is being translated to machine code. And for x86 case, especially when you do it in Unix world, the user space programs, it basically makes a call to the right function or whichever function that you define. And before passing that, there is a way in which it passes the arguments. And that is called the ABI, application binary interface. And by default, Linux uses system V. And in case of system V, 64 bit ABI, it actually uses these registers to pass the argument. First argument in RDI, second argument in RSI, third in RDX and RCX, then so on till R9. You're good. You're seeing the same thing there. EDX and RDX are pretty much the same. It's just 32 bit version of that register. That's it. It is passing the third argument to RDX as shown here and second to RSI and first to RDA or EDA. And then it is making the call to write. As we have statically compiled and statically linked this binary, the definition for write function should be also available here. Now you could use the same disassemble command to disassemble the write function and you could see something here. Ignore things above it, okay? It comes here and it is actually moving a value one to EAX register. In our case, we did it to RAX register and then it is making a system call. And it is also doing so many other things and it might make it aligned to the way it actually wants for the kernel interface, okay? So for the kernel interface, that is whenever you are making a syscall, okay? And like when you give zero one, it actually do, it actually calls syswrite. And where is this function defined? It's actually defined inside kernel. And now when you call a kernel specific function like syswrite, you need to pass the arguments in this fashion. That is first argument in RDI, second argument in RSI, third argument in RDX and so on. But there is a difference. It uses R10, R8 and R9 in this order. Whereas here R10 itself is not there. So one thing we are sure, if it is just us three arguments, we don't have to worry. And that is the same case for the write function. 
right function only takes three arguments that is the right function let's say the right function which is defined by glibc and which internally calls syswrite okay now this has three args which are set to this corresponding registers rdi rdx and rsi so rsi and this and that invokes a calls to write glibc and glibc might or might not arrange it rearrange it as per the requirement but for the write there is no need to arrange it rearrange because syscall or the system write is going to use these three registers in the same order for the arguments so it's again rdi will have the first one rsi will have the second one and rdx will have the third one and you are good to call the syscall or this is called for the write now what we did is we basically skipped this part we defined our own write which is just a small portion for us that is making the system call when you do syscall with an ex value 0 1 it is calling this function inside the kernel or it's technically executing that system call and it also expects the same set of arguments and as we are using c compiler it's a standard c compiler he is also compliant to system b and he is using or he is going to pass the arguments in the same fashion so that means when we write write let's say i'm calling one from a, some character array and the size it is going to put the corresponding arguments in the same way the system write is expecting so i am just keeping everything that is present here you should always have this in mind and you should have this mapping in mind now let's do one thing i'm cutting this i'll start our init function with gdb set this assembly flavor to intel this assemble main and the main function here is actually generated by c compiler so it's going to be same yeah it's going to be same it's going to pass the arguments that we defined even though the compiler did not know what the right function would look like it knows it will take three arguments that because we wrote the function with three parameters so it will set up the registers in the exact same way as it would do for a standard function and you could see the same thing here and it is indeed calling right now the difference is where is right defined and who defined it we defined it in our own object file and if you give this assemble right here you could see it's very small it's indeed copying the value 0 1 to eax or the rax register and making the system call that is syscall will internally call what it will call sys underscore write because it is passed with an argument of one in rx register and the system write or sys write expects the arguments in the exact same fashion so linux would happily execute it by taking the necessary parameters from the user space and execute it and give you the output as expected that is the reason why we never bothered about much while implementing the write function whereas if it was a function that would take five or four arguments then you have to put this into consideration so in that case the register order would be different and if you are mapping it to a system call you are responsible for swapping the registers and giving the necessary things in the exact same fashion as it expects okay hope you guys understood why we did this approach and why we actually created our own system call implementation Hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you.